Hello, everyone around the world. Dobri Dan. Welcome to the Eurasia launch of IFRI's 2020 Global Food Policy Report. IFRI is delighted to organize this virtual event with the Eurasian Center for Food Security at Lomonosov Moscow State University, the Westminster International University in Tashkent, and the World Bank Group. This launch event is being simultaneously translated into English and French. I'm Rajal Pandya Loj, Director for Communications and Public Affairs at IFPRI, and I will be the moderator of this event. Our flagship report provides perspectives on major food policy issues, developments, and opportunities. This year's report highlights the critical role that inclusive food systems can play in improving nutrition, creating employment and income generating opportunities and increasing empowerment of disadvantaged groups. This is especially important at a time when COVID-19 is having an immense impact on our health and food systems on a global scale, including in the Eurasia region. I'm also happy to let you know that IFPRI, together with the Westminster International University in Tashkent and IAMO, is organizing a virtual seminar series in applied economics and policy analysis in Central Asia. Thank you for joining the special virtual event. And thank you to those of you who are watching this recording after the event. We are eager to hear from you and to participate in our Q&A session that will follow the presentations, please submit your questions at any time using the chat or questions box. We have an exciting program lined up for you. And without further ado, we'd like to call on Professor Sergei Shoba, Director of the Eurasian Center for Food Security at the Lomonosov Moscow State University for his opening remarks. Over to you, Professor Shoba. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear Chairman, dear Director Johan Swimen, dear colleagues, since 2016, together with the Eurasian Center of Food Security and the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFRI and World Bank, Moscow State University launched an international conference on agriculture and food security in Eurasia. This year, because of COVID-19, we changed the event format and combined two country conferences in Moscow and Tashkent in one online session. So this is our fifth conference and uh, your our first virtual experience. It will be devoted to IFPRI annual report discussion about Eurasian Soil Food Policy 2020. Our cooperation with IFPRI started in 2012, and today we can talk about full-scale collaboration in scientific research and our specialists exchange. We have prepared the memorandum and agreed on the joint action plan. This plan includes a wide range of questions of food security analysis and development in agri-food trade in Eurasia. Eurasia. The latest IFPRI report is devoted to organization of inclusive food systems in order to improve nutrition, increase rural people, employment and income, and also to create new opportunities for the vulnerable parts of population, small farmers, youth, women, people suffered in different conflicts and just the poor. For example, chapter of Central Asia uh, in the report prepared by IFRI together with uh, Eurasian Center focuses on the top priority problem of fighting poverty and unemployment, especially among women and youth. Why the employment possibilities is a key factor to increase income, secure equal conditions and good nutri nutrition in rural areas. This year, world food systems suffer a lot because of COVID-19. Uh, International Monetary Fund, Fund estimates the world economy to be declined 
about uh, 3% because of isolation, travel restrictions, and the lockdown of industrial enterprises. In some Eurasian countries, this decline will be even bigger from 4 to 8%. The unemployment growth and household income decrease will lead to the growth of vulnerable social groups, deterioration of food accessibility and nutrition quality. But it is both to mention that many countries have developed a wide scale program to minimize the impact of COVID-19. They will allow to soften the consequences of economy uh, slowdown and to ensure a quick food system recovery after the pandemic is over. But this recovery may be complicated by the climatic changes. Uh, mass locust in invasion is a huge threat for many countries of Africa and Asia. All these factors can lead to possible development of pandemic, in, of pandemic into global human catastrophe and large-scale food crisis. I am sure that our conference will have positive impact on our mutual cooperation in order to improve food security and develop sustainable food system in Eurasia. I wish a productive work and success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shoba. And we are delighted to continue this fine tradition of hosting the launch of the uh, Global Food okay. Policy Report. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now call on Mr. Renaud Seligman, who is the World Bank Country Director for the Russian Federation, for his opening remarks. Over to you, Mr. Seligman. Fajul, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome uh, all of you to the launch of this very important re report on global food policy. Um, uh, for this year, of course, the impact of, of COVID-19 uh, uh, on the food systems of the of the region uh, uh, is going to be absolutely essential. And I would say, you know, it's not just a double whammy, it's a triple whammy that we have this year. Uh, we have uh, already an underlying weakness that came from the swine flu, uh, as well as the locust invasion. Uh, and on top of that, we now have uh, the physical dislocation of supply chains uh, that came from the COVID crisis. Now, add to that uh, the uh, human intervention. And uh, through protectionism, um, this can lead to very significant negative impact uh, on food prices that particularly affect the poor. It's an extremely regressive policy. We found that in 2010, 2011, 40% of the increasing global price of wheat and 25%, a quarter of the increase in the rise of maize were due to basically protectionism. Um, and unfortunately, this story is at risk of repeating itself uh, in the fallout from the COVID-19 crisis. Now, who will suffer from that are essentially the poor. Um, the poorest countries, which are the most food vulnerable, but also within those poor countries, the poorest parts of the population. And that's why uh, the theme of this year's report on um, developing inclusive food systems is particularly relevant and important. Um, it is about protecting the most vulnerable. It is about a new participatory way of shaping the global food system that is aimed at reducing inequality between the rich and the poor, between the urban and the rural, between men and women. And in Central Asia, particularly uh, the idea of, of creating jobs that are well-paying jobs, particularly among the youth and women, uh, uh, is uh, an, an especially important uh, dimension of these inclusive food systems. Of course, food habits are changing around the world. Vegetarianism, veganism is on the rise. Um, there is a backlash against Meat, but there are also uh, exciting new opportunities for food systems to adjust 
to higher value products, berries and fruits, um, and other uh, 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 chains can uh, evolve on the basis of that evol uh, evolution of the population. And for sure, that evolution will continue uh, in the context uh, uh, post uh, COVID. And so uh, there are some uh, groups of the population that tends to be left out. Um, those could be smallholder farmers, they could be youth or women, conflict affected people. Um, but uh, it's very important to uh, reach out to them and to include them better in the food systems in order to increase the overall resilience of the system to challenges that have been referred to by Professor Shoba, such as climate change, but also malnutrition uh, and, of course, uh, the pandemic. But, of course, we're not alone in this fight. Um, we can now rely on uh, new technologies uh, that are extremely powerful, that can empower farmers, give them the tools they need to be part of this inclusive food system. Growth in off-farm segments of the food supply chain, increasing demand for higher value food products, the ones I was referring to earlier, closer urban rural linkages and the development of small cities and towns uh, all provide income and employment opportunities for participants all along the food supply chain. And that can make them more inclusive. Um, so the report also highlights that policies should secure more equal benefits and participation for all groups. But there are data gaps uh, and there is probably insufficient research uh, in that uh, very important area of policy. So this is maybe something that we need to consider for the future. So finally, uh, the World Bank and the Eurasian Center for Food Security are working together with researchers from Central Asia, from the South Caucasus in a joint program to improve data collection and provide policymakers with the evidence they need uh, to craft uh, those policy measures that would help to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on food uh, 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 and nutrition security. So for sure, today's discussion will be extremely useful to identify uh, assistance measures, uh, analytical support uh, needed, and, you know, I would say policy action uh, that are needed to eliminate the consequences of the pandemic and the other underlying weaknesses in the uh, global food system and to build a more inclusive food systems. These tasks are really challenging. Solving them will require coordinated action, and I'm extremely happy to be partnering with all of the stakeholders present today uh, in order to uh, address this challenge. You know, we can imagine uh, the future in a very dystopian uh, uh, way, as a future uh, include uh, combined, uh, combining uh, pandemics uh, with famine. But we can also uh, imagine a more optimistic future, one of global collaboration and uh, food security. Thank you and over. Thank you very much, Mr. Seligman, for your remarks, as well as that last note of optimism and the note you made earlier about the opportunity to participate in reshaping our food systems in a more inclusive manner. Thank you for your remarks and we appreciate that you're joining us. Colleagues, we'd like to move then to our next speaker, who is IFPRI's Director General, Jo Swinnen, to present an overview of the report and focus on COVID-19 and uh, potential implications. Over to you, Jo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajul. Uh, thank you also to Professor Shoba and Dr. Seligman for their excellent introductions to uh, the workshop today. They already uh, covered several of the points that are actually part of the, of the report. Um, it's, uh, I was gonna say it's great to be in Moscow again, but obviously I'm not in Moscow. Uh, I really would have liked to be there also because uh, I was there for the last two years for um, the, and, and basically the presentation of IFPRI's global food policy report. And last year, I very much remember because I was walking around barefooted because I had broken my toe and I couldn't wear uh, shoes uh, standing in front of uh, the audience. Um, it's uh, certainly great to continue this tradition, the collaboration with the Eurasian Center for Food Security, uh, Moscow State University and the World Bank. And also great to have today on the panel uh, colleagues from other universities in the region. The report, uh, our uh, global food policy report, the title is Building Inclusive Food Systems, was written uh, before COVID broke out. But obviously the outbreak of COVID has had tremendous impacts on food system. 
And the point I will make today is that the conclusions of the report are, uh, are still very much relevant today. And actually, in a way, I will come to the conclusion that inclusive food systems are even more important today than they were uh, before COVID-19 broke out. Let me go to the next slide, has a quick review of the different chapters of the report. You see, uh, we have a general overview chapter on the imperative of inclusion. Uh, chapter two is about smallholders and rural people. Then chapters about youth, women, refugees. Um, and then we also have uh, a chapter on national food systems, okay? How they can be adjusted to make inclusiveness in food systems more effective. We have a series of regional chapters, including one on Central Asia, as Professor Shoba already uh, referred to. Uh, on the next slide, I have a kind of a summary of some of the, the points. Why are inclusive food systems important? Well, they're important for um, a variety of reasons, okay? They can, if designed well, they can promote inclusive economic growth by better integrating uh, groups in society which are often marginalized, such as smallholders, women, youth, refugees, etc. Uh, they can reduce poverty by basically integrating these people both in economic systems, but also in the decision-making process, a broader, I would say, political process around it, okay? They can uh, improve access to services, and services can mean all kinds of things, including health services, obviously, which is uh, very important today. Inclusive food systems can break the cycle of poverty, hunger, malnutrition. Often these things have and do persist for generations. And so we have to find a way of basically breaking the cycle to come out. And by doing this, by basically including uh, social groups which are often marginalized, they can reduce inequalities both locally and uh, globally. On the next slide, I have, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we have summarized briefly four large uh, groups of policies, if you want, or policy themes that we discuss uh, extensively in the report. One is the how to create uh, inclusive food value chains, okay, focusing on the, on the supply chains, on the value chain, and especially the integration of smallholder farms. Social protection is obviously really important and it uh, has gained an importance today in uh, the COVID crisis. Education is possibly in the long run one of the most uh, important elements or drivers of inclusion, not just in food systems, but in economic and political integration in general. Information and the technology revolution, which is playing out there is important. And then the last thing is about governance and leadership. I will come back to these items at the, at the end of my presentation and provide a bit more details on the specific policy uh, recommendations there. Now on the next slide, I have listed, I've presented two graphs just to document how how, uh, how heterogeneous the how <clears throat> the large heterogeneity in Eurasia in terms of uh, the countries and in this case particularly in terms of the role of agriculture and food systems okay and uh, <clears throat> these are all what I would call the former Soviet Union uh, Soviet countries and Eastern European countries there and the one with the red uh, circle around them that's the countries in Central Asia and so what you see is that these countries drift tremendously in the role that agriculture plays in their economy and also in incomes and a number of other ways. So in the next slide, I have uh, listed a number of other uh, <clears throat> elements of heterogeneity. Uh, natural resources are very different. For example, access to water, mountainous regions versus flat, fertile land areas differ tremendously among the countries. Income levels differ strongly. Also with that, should, of course, the, the importance of poverty, food security. Farm structures are very different. So you have some of the largest farms in the world in the region. And at the same time, many parts of the region have are characterized by domination of very small smallholder farms. Uh, some countries are major exporters of food. Other ones are uh, mainly imports of food. So these things ob obviously matter, okay? So if we are talking about inclusion, then in terms of turning this into policy uh, actions at the national or the local levels, one has to take into account, obviously, these differences in food systems or in economic and political systems more generally, okay? In the, um, the next slides, I have basically then brought in, before we go back at the end, okay, and talk on some of these specific policy actions, I'm gonna talk a bit about COVID-19 first. So how does COVID-19 affect these conclusions? 
We know now, as is listed on the next slide, that COVID-19 essentially causes, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Seligman said it has, it, there's a triple whammy going on. I think in terms of the COVID effect, there's two different aspects which are really important to understand. It's a combination of a standard economic recession and a food system disruption. Now, when have we seen this before, this combination? Well, we've seen it before in this part of the world. In the next slide, I have basically presented, <clears throat> this is uh, the evolution of income in the former Soviet Union from basically after the Second World War to 2010. And what you see is a huge decline of income in the 1990s, okay? And this was caused, of course, by the transition uh, um, of going from one economic and political system to another one. And this caused both an economic recession and a system disruption, system, economic system in general, but also the food system. And as we can see, this had huge implications for the region. And so in that way, the lessons we can draw from that are relevant for the COVID-19 crisis for the world today, I think. In the next slide, there's a similar story. Um, these are data based on agriculture. So on the left panel, you see what happened to agriculture production, which fell very strongly in the early 1990s throughout this part of the world. And uh, yields as fell very strongly as well, as is illustrated on the right panel. These are grain yields from Ukraine, uh, Russia, and, and uh, Kazakhstan, okay, which fell almost by 30 to 50%. So if we then basically go back to COVID in the world today and take into account some of these lessons, on the next slide, to summarize what an economic recession does, okay, of food security. It basically, it increases poverty. And this, as we know very well, has an impact on the quantity of food and on the quality of food that is consumed. So food security goes down, uh, diet quality uh, goes down as well, as uh, consumers typically shift to uh, cheaper food. And so in, what's interesting is that for the, on the consumer side, okay, what's happening is very similar to what happened in 2007, 2011 when food prices went up because then prices went up and income stayed the same. Now incomes uh, fall strongly, but prices stay the same. So the net effect, the real effect is very similar. However, on the production side, their effects are very different. Okay, We see there that uh, producers are not benefiting from high prices on global markets. They're actually hurt as well with the disruptions of food systems of the supply chains. And in that way, the COVID outbreak is much more similar to the transition process in this part of the world in the 1990s than it is to the food price crisis. Next slide, please. So we had, if we have done a number of assessments on the impact on the world, and on the left-hand panel, you see what we estimate to be the impact of the recession on global poverty. And we estimate that roughly 150 uh, million more people can go into extreme poverty as a consequence of the recession effects, okay? Most of these are in Africa, but also a big chunk are in, in South Asia. On the right panel, we then estimate what the impact is gonna be on, on nutrition, on the types of food that will be consumed. And as you can expect, the, there is a clear shift from uh, more nutritious foods, such as uh, fruits and vegetables, dairy and meat, to less nutritious food, but basically calories to stay alive. And this is the shift we see. So these numbers are averages for the world, right? If we're going to go into country uh, details, and I'll show some uh, data later, we see that the impacts can be quite uh, much stronger than that even. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the food system disruption, what we see here is that um, COVID is hitting or is hurting one particular input production factor very strongly, which is labor, okay? And this is, uh, in a way, it's similar to what happened in the transition uh, process in the 1990s, because then uh, one production factor was, was hurt very much as well, but that was capital, okay? And so what we saw is that in that in the transition process, what was really affected, which food system were very, those were the capital intensive food system because it was a shrinking of the capital base of access to credit, et cetera. What we see now, what is uh, affected mostly is not the capital intensive system, it's the labor intensive system. And so if you look at the supply chains, where are the big problem? That's where a lot of people have come together physically. Okay. And so this can be in developing countries, it's, it's fairly general, it has with harvesting, processing, transporting, et cetera but also in, in more developed economies, okay, we see that some of the supply chains are very vulnerable. That, for example, there is a lot of problem with some of the harvesting where migrant labor is used. 
There is problems in the, for example, in the meat processing sector in the United States, which is really affected because people have to stand too close in the processing facilities. And that means these things are breaking down, okay? Also in Eurasia, that means there, there's probably gonna be very little impact on the harvesting of grain in uh, Kazakhstan or Russia, et cetera, because of the big uh, combined harvests. But there may be very strong impacts on some of the other sectors where labor is used more intensively. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide kind of just summarizes this thing on, on, the, on the food supply chains in terms of the value chains. And so this category, which is done, there's three different categories, traditional, the modern, and the transitional, if, as they call it. And what you see, it's really the traditional and the, tra the transitional, if you want, which are hurt and much less the, the modern uh, supply chains. Again, because they are much more knowledge and capital intensive than the other supply chains. So what does that mean for poverty? Well, it means, as Dr. Seligman has said in the introduction, that the poor are hurt disproportionately. On the next slide, I have listed a number of reasons why that is the case. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast here. So this slide has uh, also brings out a point with, which Dr. Seligman already said. This is what, what do consumers do and what do governments do when they fear a shortage? They start uh, panicking and they start hoarding food. And we've seen in many countries that uh, Consumers have gone to the market, tried to buy as much food as possible to store it. Countries, particularly the exporting countries, are doing similar things. Okay, so they have introduced uh, export restrictions. And if you look at the right hand panel, there's a list of uh, food importing countries which are particularly affected potentially. And if you look at the top, you see there's a lot of Central Asian countries there Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, so basically Central Asia and, and the Caucasus. And why is that? Because these are countries which are importing a lot of their staple commodities. That's also illustrated on the next slide. Uh, I'm sure you know this slide. And basically, if you see some of these countries, such as Armenia, Georgia, Tajikistan, the same countries as were on top there, they import a lot of the grain, their basic staple commodities, uh, which they are uh, consuming, okay? And that means they're also very vulnerable to export restraints which are being imposed by other countries. And that's why uh, the World Bank and IFPRI and many other organizations have basically uh, brought out statements that uh, introducing of export constraint is not a good policy at this point in time in order not to make the food security problems in the world not worse than they already are. Next slide, please. So the next slide then is the, uh, I've listed six reasons why the poor, why poor people are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Uh, first of all, economic recessions affect their incomes more strongly than uh, rich people. They spend a larger share of their income on food, as we all know, which, affect, which of course means that if their income goes down, the impact on food security and nutrition security is larger. An important factor is that, you know, rich people have, they have assets, they may have land, they may have a factory, uh, they may have highly qualified uh, skills. For example, I can continue to, to work because I can talk to you through, uh, through Zoom or I can use my computer. Poor people usually only have labor, so they have physical labor, they have to go out to work. And that factor is obviously very strongly constrained now, both by COVID itself and by the lockdown policies. We also know that COVID is causing more disruptions in, in private food value chains, as I just explained, because of the labor intensity. And then the public food and nutrition programs are interrupted uh, quite strongly in these countries. Okay, And that means that poor people who benefit from them, for, for example, by public food distribution programs or by basically nutrition programs or health programs, they are hurt because, for example, the schools are closed, there's no school feeding programs or the community centers are closed, et cetera. And then finally, the fiscal capacity of, of uh, poor countries' government is typically less to basically intervene to support uh, certain programs in these countries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I am going to skip this slide. Uh, it just illustrates some more illustrations on the impact of, uh, <clears throat> of the closing of the public support programs. This uh, slide basically is about the importance of remittances in Eurasia on the left hand side and on the right hand side you can you can see how the the the, cry, the economic uh, <clears throat> crisis in Russia in 2014 2017 had a big impact on remittances in the region and some of the countries are very dependent on these remittances and that of course 
is really affected now because remittances been, means that people physically go and travel to another country, work there and send the income back home. Okay, and that is very strongly affected by uh, the uh, by COVID-19. Next slide, please. Here we have a country study for, uh, from Nigeria where IFPRI is doing a whole series of country studies. And so here we see that the, within the agri-food system, okay, so the food, what is really affected is food services, okay? And this trickles down to impacts throughout the agri-food system, but it's the close down of the food services, which is really triggering the negative effect in uh, the other sectors of the agri-food economy. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've listed up a number of policy actions on COVID-19. I have used, I know that I'm using, I've used up most of my time. I have already listed most of these things. I will go to the next slide. And basically, I think this is the key point here, okay? So we have um, the, the key point bringing back to our, the, the food policy report, okay, is that we need to include the food system more than ever now. So COVID-19 is not changing our conclusions, it's actually reinforcing the conclusions, okay? So inclusive va value change, we need to restructure the value change, especially for smallholders. We need to invest more in social protection to deal with poverty in general, food and nutrition security in general, but also the COVID effects we need to invest more in education, more in information distribution, more in IT systems, because these IT systems will also allow basically access of, uh, of or, or basically addressing some of the, the constraints which are posed by uh, COVID-19. And, and then also governance and uh, leadership are more important now than ever. In the rest of the presentation, I have given some details on this. I am going to stop here because I've, I've used up my time, but the slides will be made available. The final slide also has a list, uh, refers to our IFPRI website, because and that IFPRI website has all kinds of information on uh, a whole series of blogs. We have roughly 35 blogs now on COVID, so I really encourage you to go and take a look there if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Swinnon, for that comprehensive review of the food policy report, as well as the COVID-19 implications and potential actions. We'll come back to that during the discussion. Let me now call on Dr. Kamil John Akramov, Senior Research Fellow in the Development Strategy and Governance Division at IFPRI, for his remarks. Dr. Akramov, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajul, and good morning. Uh, uh, Dr. Swinnan already uh, discussed in great detail the uh, main message from Global Food Policy Report for Eurasia region. In my presentation, I will uh, talk briefly about a uh, few aspects of the report and insights from report for Central Asia. Next slide, please. I will talk about two important uh, aspects of it. Uh, food system inclusiveness, uh, first about employment and power reduction, second about uh, importance of labor migration and remittance. And I, I, pro I will provide some details about these two important aspects of food systems inclusiveness. Then I will talk about uh, risks and challenges, uh, elements of COVID-19 pandemic, and I will conclude with uh, uh, some policy options for governments of the region. Next slide, please. As you know, Central Asian countries are uh, have a very young population, and these countries were going through a demographic transition over the several decades. And from other countries' experience, especially from experience of uh, East Asian countries, we know that demographic transition, especially demographic dividend, plays important role in boosting economic growth and. Uh, increasing inclusiveness of food systems. Unfortunately, Central Asian countries were not able so far to benefit from this great advantage uh, because of uh, limited employment opportunities. The share of working age people in the region uh, has been increasing steadily and the youth make up now about one, up to one third of the total population and, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, uh, employment opportunities are very limited. So in Uzbekistan, 
about 15% of use are unemployment. More importantly, in the rural areas, unemployment is even higher. In Kyrgyzstan's mountains regions, about 40% of young women are unemployment. Unemployed, actually. Uh, women's empowerment is very important for uh, inclusive food systems. And so creating uh, job opportunities for women and youth will play a very important role in the future. Next slide, please. Dr. Swinan already mentioned migration and remittance play an important role for uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so remittance can contribute to economic stability, increase the incomes, part of actually and food security. But labor migration has two uh, competing effects on food systems and agriculture. So labor remittance on the one side can improve household welfare and food access by increasing income. So uh, our IFRI's recent survey in Tajikistan showed that households receiving remittance from uh, labor migrants have better food security and better data diversity. So, but on the other hand, labor migration from these countries tend to be predominantly male and rural, which leads to feminization of agricultural labor. So this has very important implications for uh, food and nutrition security in the region. So on this uh, diagram, you can see that as uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sivina already mentioned uh, in 2014, 2015, when Russia was facing uh, economic crisis, labor migrants sent less uh, remittance back to their home countries. During the last uh, several years, starting from 2017, this process uh, improved and remittance was recovering uh, steadily. But COVID-19 had main uh, major impacts on this process as well. Next slide, please. So in this uh, diagram, uh, I put together uh, some findings from uh, timeline of the COVID-19 and government responses in Central Asia and Russia. If we put together a very important tool, uh, food, uh, government responses tracking tool, which puts together uh, timeline of the COVID-19 and also how uh, policymakers in Central Asia and elsewhere around the globe uh, responded to this. Actually, so this is a great tool. I think uh, researchers, policymakers can benefit from this tool. Here in this diagram, uh, we highlight some very important uh, milestones in this uh, timeline. So. One important thing actually that some countries in the region uh, imposed export ban and export restrictions on food imports, which has actually very uh, important implications for food access in food importing countries like Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. So as previous speakers also mentioned, prices for wheat and wheat products were hiking, were increasing. So this has actually great impact on poor people. We have some evidence that in Tajikistan or in Uzbekistan, all of the wheat uh, flour prices are growing significantly. So this has very important implications for nutrition as well, uh, because when poor people have to spend more on staple food, they will have less income to spend on other food items. So this will decrease data diversity with great implications for nutrition outcomes. One good news actually, Kazakhstan plans to remove export restrictions starting June 1st. This will be uh, good news for other countries of the region as well. One important message from this actually, uh, Russia and Central Asian countries do not seem to have reach their peak of uh, confirmed cases yet. And the crisis is very much ongoing 
and this will have great implications for economic uh, activity and the food systems in near future. Next slide, please. So what are the risks and challenges for Central Asia? In this slide, I uh, listed some of these uh, risks and challenges. Of course, we have uh, great uncertainties about the size, severity, and duration of pandemic and related economic downturn. So I, World Bank, IMF, ADB, and national governments have uh, various forecasts about the GDP growth. And so all these forecasts uh, have one common ground. They all mentioned that these countries will either face a recession or significant decline in the economic growth. So this will have great implications for uh, food systems development in the region. Another important factor is uh, this country's trade greatly with Russia and China. So health and economic conditions in these countries will have actually great impact on Central Asian countries. So vulnerabilities in these countries will have uh, major impact on food and nutrition security in the region. Obviously, the three key source of income will decline significantly, remittance, commodity exports, and tourism. So we can predict how much remittance will decline. But if we use uh, experience from 2014 and 2015, remittance from Russia to Central Asia declined more than two times during that time. So we already have some data from first quarter of uh, this year, which shows actually significant decline in remittance from the, uh, Russia to Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. So Russia plays very important uh, role for labor migration and remittance for these countries. In terms of commodity exports, of course, we all know oil prices, natural gas prices, and some other uh, export commodities from this region is in decline. So this will have huge impact for these countries. Tourism plays a very important role in the region, especially for Uzbekistan, which benefited a lot during the last few years when the country was opening up. And last year, for example, Uzbekistan gave revenue from tourism was about 1.5 billion. So this year, of course, uh, revenue from tourism sector will decline significantly and it will have huge impact on food and nutrition security of the people who are engaged in tourism sector. So another factor is a reduction in demand for regions agri-food exports, disruptions in value chains and domestic food price hikes. We already mentioned about the wheat price hike and also the wheat flour price hike and this will have huge impact on food and nutrition security. Of course, uh, significant fiscal pressures, uh, inevitable increase in poverty and need for increased social protection is very important. And uh, so we know actually the poverty is sizable in the region. Uh, for example, in Uzbekistan, about 10 to 15% of the population live on the poverty line. COVID-19 environment because of lockdown and other policies and declining remittance, uh, commodity export revenues and tourism revenues will lead to higher poverty rates. And uh, of course, uh, vulnerabilities to commodity price uh, and depreciation of national currency and weak external positions have also will have important impact. Some countries in the region have uh, more stable external positions like uh, Kazakhstan and to some extent Uzbekistan, but countries like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan uh, face very weak external positions. This will have huge uh, impact on food and nutrition and other uh, parts of the economy as well. Next slide, please. So what are the uh, policy options in this slide? I listed some short-term and medium-term policy options. Of course, these are by no means an exhaustive list. So, of course, first and most important thing is managing pandemic and health risk. 
So, so far, countries in the region are mainly doing uh, diagnostic cases, but uh, they need to start implementing surveillance tests to have some idea about the spread of uh, the virus in the communities. So I think Uzbekistan is already starting this and other countries of the region, uh, of course, they will need that as well. And improved social protection for vulnerable households and poor, as we mentioned, the poor will increase, number of poor will increase. This is very important. And of course, supporting agricultural producers and small and medium enterprises, especially in the sectors like uh, tourism and service uh, will be very important. But the reality is most countries in the region have very limited resources for such support. That's why support from international financial institutions like World Bank, IMF, and the Asian Development Bank will be very important, as well as support from donors will be very key here. In the medium term, these countries will need to promote agricultural diversification and also to nutrition sense of value chains. That's all that are happening in uh, countries like Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, but uh, more efforts will be needed in this regard. Most importantly, these policies should be based on competitive, promoting competitive environment and market-based uh, incentives for producers. Investment in rural infrastructure and connectivity is obviously very important roads and other infrastructure are very important for promoting uh, supply chains and connectivity is very important actually this COVID-19 environment already shown us actually that access to internet is very important it's not secret in rural areas of Central Asia access to internet is very limited so investment in connectivity will be very important and this may help uh, empower farmers, and this may help to improve their access to various agri and food advisor services, and then it may also help to improve or to have access to foreign markets and improve traceability of their products in the uh, market. So, of course, encouraging institutional policy and technological innovations are very important and uh, so countries or governments of the region should uh, try to implement diverse policies they should avoid one size fits all policies which is abundant in the region at the moment so one type of policies may be beneficial in one part of the country, but other policies may be needed in other parts of the country. So this is uh, very uh, important uh, to have in mind. Of course, strengthening analytical and policy research capacity is very important. And so need for better data, applied policy research and evidence-based decision making is very important. Currently, ad hoc policies are abandoned in the region governments will need evidence-based decision-making because sometimes government policies may actually harm rather than benefit uh, agricultural producers and general population. So looking what is working, what's not working uh, is very important for government policy. And obviously, already people mentioned that the better data is very important. This is very important for Central Asia even more because lack of representative data at the household level and reliable data at the sector and macro level is very uh, important for the region and countries of the region lack representative household service uh, to better estimate and to better uh, analyze poverty, food security, and nutrition indicators. In this regard, IFPRI is trying to 
work with the various partners in the region by conducting uh, household surveys and other uh, data generation activities and also capacity strengthening activities together with the Westminster International University in Tashkent and Lomonosov Moscow University, uh, Lomonosov Moscow State University are some examples of our activities there. Next slide, please. Kamil Jan, to wrap up, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so lastly, I would like to mention uh, support for IFPRI's work in the region uh, from the Minister of Finance of the Russian Federation, the USAID, the World Bank and the ADB, and uh, some other partners are in the region uh, working with us to promote these uh, activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akramov. Thank you for sharing that overview uh, and uh, walking through the policy options and issues. We now have uh, three very distinguished discussants with us. But before I introduce them, I would like to remind all of you who are listening to us, watching this event virtually, that you can submit your brief questions in the chat or questions box. We will be coming to the Q&A session soon, and we are very keen to hear from you and your questions. So please do go ahead and submit them and we'll take them up shortly. So as I mentioned, we have three very distinguished discussants with us. And before I introduce them, I'd like to convey apologies from our fourth discussant who had to unexpectedly go into a meeting just at the same time and cannot be with us today. And this is uh, Mr. Artavazad Hakobian who conveys his profuse apologies to us. So our first discussant is Dr. Kamil John Karimov, Rector of Westminster International University in Tashkent and one of the partners of this event. We look forward to your remarks, Dr. Karimov. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I uh, would like to start my very brief uh, intervention with a word of thanks. As uh, Madam Che has just mentioned, uh, our university, Westminster International University in Tashkent is a, a partner for the launch of this report. And I would like to thank uh, IFPRI and uh, in particular Director General, uh, the Professor Swinen for inviting uh, our university to, to be a partner here. But this is not first time that we are working with uh, IFPRI on the launch of this important flagship uh, food policy uh, the report. Uh, this is the third time uh, we're partnering with IFPRI and two previous uh, launches of the global report for Central Asia were in fact physically held in this university uh, with participation of colleagues from IFPRI and other uh, the, the institutions. So uh, we, we have a very uh, the important uh, track record of partnership with IFPRI. And as uh, Madame Che has also mentioned in the beginning, uh, it's very symbolic uh, that uh, from today, uh, it, again, with IFPRI and with IAMA, which is the Leibniz Institute of Agricultural Development in Transitional Economies, uh, we are launching uh, the series of uh, virtual seminars on applied economics and uh, policy analysis in Central Asia. And that will be held, uh, they will be uh, weekly webinars uh, throughout three uh, months, uh, uh, stretching up to the end of August. Uh, and I uh, would like to use this opportunity and invite audience to join this uh, important webinars. So now on, 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 on this, uh, the, a few remarks on uh, global uh, food policy report. And I, I, I'm not going to repeat uh, the colleagues, uh, Professor Sinan and uh, Dr. Akrama, for, who has, I think in detail, um, uh, they elaborated uh, the, the standing uh, with regard to food policies in Central Asian countries. But I think one thing is important to define. Central Asia uh, has uh, different definitions. Uh, uh, so the, the larger Central Asia, in fact, in, includes uh, five uh, post-Soviet countries, but also some researchers include Afghanistan, Iran, and even other countries. But in the, in the, in the context of this, uh, the presentation, I think we will be talking about uh, mainly uh, five post-Soviet countries, right, uh, of which Uzbekistan is part as well. Of course, uh, this was also uh, mentioned already, countries share common history and legacy. Uh, they were part of a larger country, as you know, 30 years ago, for, for about 75 years. 
uh, and uh, still share many common features. But in terms of the food policies and food systems, uh, the countries have a very uh, different, quite different characteristics. And uh, Professor Sinan has mentioned that some countries, uh, they are heavily dependent on uh, food imports and uh, the, the structure of the economy, uh, the, the largest part of the GDP constitutes exports of uh, natural resources and countries uh, like Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, I would, I would suggest they heavily uh, in fact, uh, dependent on food imports. Whereas uh, Uzbekistan, for, in, for instance, is, is an agri-food exporter and that uh, the export of agri-food uh, is, is, is increasing and becoming a very important part of uh, Uzbekistan's economy. And my prom, uh, obviously my primary focus uh, today will be on Uzbekistan and uh, recent very profound changes in uh, agricultural and uh, food policies. And to make my talk a bit more systematic, I would like to focus on both supply and demand, uh, demand side of uh, the food systems in this country. In terms of the supply, they, I think my colleagues have already mentioned this and uh, half of uh, the country's population, which is by the way, largest uh, in terms of the population in Central Asian region with now over 35 million people living in country. Uh, so half of these 34 million, in fact, live in rural area. And obviously, as a uh, quite heavily dependent on uh, agriculture and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the export of the agri-food. And, uh, and therefore, the agriculture is central to Uzbekistan's economy. It contributes now, according to ADB uh, recent data, um, the agriculture contributes uh, to about 44% of uh, the country's gross domestic product, GDP, and 27% of uh, total labor employment. So it's quite a big number. The country has two distinct and uh, coexisting individual agricultural systems that produce both crops and livestock. The dominant one is that of uh, smallholders who are small scale family farms, about 0.2 hectares on average, and locally known as dehkans or uh, household farms. The second is that of large individual private farms over 15 hectares of land and known as farmer and mainly producing cotton and wheat. The former represents more than 85% of the agricultural producers in the country and contribute to 70% of overall total agricultural production uh, despite suboptimal land size and small per capita uh, life, livestock herd size. But uh, in opposite, Dehkan uh, farms, they produce more than 60% of uh, country's uh, uh, horticulture uh, crops. And for the last three years, I believe Uzbekistan has done a profound change in this sector. Transformation of the agricultural system is one of the central reforms in Uzbekistan. For the first time country, for the first time in its in the independence for these 30 years, uh, country has adopted long-term agricultural development strategy for 2020, 2030, and many international uh, the agencies were in fact involved and were advising uh, the government in developing the strategy. Main features of this, uh, the, if I would like to, I would like to outline those uh, policy directions of structural institutional reforms. And it, 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 the document outlines a vision for transformation of the sector over the uh, next 10 years, aiming to introduce wide range of reforms to prepare Uzbek agri-food sector to effectively compete in global markets. And the strategy provides policy legal framework for the development of agricultural and rural areas. And many of the points which my colleagues has uh, um, already mentioned, uh, which they were in fact uh, the prescribing uh, to countries uh, to take forward, I think those recommendations were included in this, uh, the reform, uh, the paper. And it provides basis for, as I said, institutional financial reforms. Uh, strategy offers nine strategic priorities for modernization and competitiveness of the sector. Priorities include establishing robust agribusiness climate, uh, developing effective value chains, uh, diversifying public expenditure, reforming public, uh, reforming public institutions uh, involved in this sector, 
And uh, what is important, I think uh, Dr. Akramov has mentioned about the evidence-based policy making and the need for uh, better data. And uh, this, uh, the reform paper, in fact, addresses this also uh, through establishing effective agriculture knowledge and information system. And then uh, obviously the theme of uh, this report, in fact, inclusive rural development, it is central in this, uh, the, the reform, uh, the document. Sustainable natural resource management, developing robust sector statistic and data collection systems. And last one, establishing efficient and effective monitoring mechanisms. So those nine uh, important pillars of this uh, strategic document. But now, of course, uh, we can talk much about this, but I know that my time is limited. And uh, the, as, as we speak uh, during the, the COVID-19 crisis, of course, Uzbekistan was uh, also uh, impacted by this with, with uh, quite a heavy lockdowns. But I think what the government has done uh, during this period it, uh, requires very close look by IFPRI and other institutions, because despite uh, my colleagues has men have mentioned about this, uh, the import restrictions and so on and so on, but Uzbekistan has not done it. In fact, uh, it has lifted all the import, uh, the barriers, you know, especially uh, for food imports to country. It also accelerated uh, the, the export of uh, the agri-food, which is, I think, very interesting. And, uh, but also I think uh, what is, again, exemplary, uh, what we, uh, in a, in a, in a, what we have seen on TVs, uh, the empty shelves in supermarkets in many countries, even in very developed uh, the nations, right? But this has not happened here. There were no uh, the interruptions in uh, the food supply chains. And in fact, as I said, uh, the government is promoting and uh, trying to accelerate uh, the export of uh, the agri-food uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to actually uh, to have uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the cash flow uh, coming in from this and to soften uh, the impact of uh, losses in other sectors. So I think all of these measures which government has taken really requires a closer look and could be a very interesting case study uh, for IFPRI and other institutions. So unfortunately, my time is over. I, I, uh, I see the Madam uh, Chair looking at me uh, so and signaling. So I will stop here, but if there will be question, I will be very happy to respond. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karimov. Thank you for your remarks and for sharing some of the key elements from Uzbekistan and in the region. And you are co very correct. We have a number of questions coming in already from our online audience. So I will go to our next two discussants and ask them to be within their time. Our second discussant is Dr. Roman Romashkin, who is Deputy Director at the Eurasian Center for Food Security at the Lomonosov Moscow State University. We look forward to your remarks. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajul. Uh, my uh, presentation will be uh, devoted to the trade issues, as trade is one of the key factors for inclusiveness in food systems. Particularly in the uh, IFPRI report, it is stated that trade conditions in Russia have significant impacts on economic growth prospects, food and nutrition security in uh, Central Asia. Next slide, please. And um, in this regard, I will uh, consider Russia's role in agri-food trade, highlight the main features of such trade and focus on uh, key factors for food systems and trade development in Central Asia and uh, Armenia as well. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, to analyze trade dynamics, uh, we made comparison with uh, 2013 trade indicators. And 2013 was chosen as the last year before sl uh, slowdown of the Russian economy due to the drop in uh, uh, oil prices and uh, depreciation of national currency. In general, you can see that uh, it has been positive trade developments between Russia and uh, focused countries since 2016. And uh, at the same time, exports grew faster than imports and uh, highest uh, export growth rates observed in Kyrgyzstan and uh, Armenia. Kazakhstan is the main trading partner of uh, Russia in the region. In addition, all Central Asian countries are net importers in agri-food trade with 
Russia. Uh, at the next slide, you can see the geographic uh, trade uh, structure. Um, and uh, we can make a, a conclusion that focused countries are heavily dependent on both Russian market and supply of Russian products. In this regard, it should be noted that facilitating access to Russian market was one of the main reasons to participate in Eurasian integration um, project. Uh, at the next slide, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I depict the general trades in agri-food trade uh, in terms of uh, trade complementarity analysis, and uh, particularly negative trade balances between Central Asian countries and Russia are likely to remain in the future because the complementarity indices between Central Asian exports and Russian imports are less than indices between uh, Russian exports and Central Asian imports. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, a slight increase in complementarity between Eurasian Economic Union countries and Russia reflects some improvement in uh, trade facilitation. Uh, nevertheless, uh, interregional trade obstacles uh, in the Eurasian Union are still kept. And uh, many studies proved that elimination of such obstacles or so-called non-tariff uh, barriers might, might contribute to significant improvements in inter-regional trade of the Eurasian Union. Next slide, please. As for major trade uh, goods, uh, there is significant difference in export and import commodity structures, particularly export from Central Asian countries and Armenia is characterized by a low commodity diversification. Fruits and vegetables are mainly supplied to Russian markets. On the contrary, uh, products imported from Russia are more diversified and processed. And taking into account input commodity structure, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan are the most vulnerable to Russian trade policy measures for certain, for several commodity groups. Uh, next slide uh, demonstrate uh, the uh, global Lloyd index values. And uh, these uh, values, this indicator are also confirmed low level of intra-industry trade between Russia and focused countries. The main reason for that is uh, the lack of diversification in the agricultural sector of Central Asia and Armenia. That's why uh, policy, uh, state policy stimulating uh, new technologies and implementation of new technologies to diversify the uh, agricultural sector is very important. And uh, the last slide depicts uh, the key factors influenced the um, trade development in Eurasia. And uh, I would like to highlight the following uh, factors. First of all, of course, it's uh, Russia's food embargo that was uh, imposed in 2014. And uh, this uh, leads to the shift uh, in trade towards uh, trade with uh, uh, Central Asian countries. Also, another important fact is uh, that I mentioned above is the formation of the Eurasian Economic Union. And there are also some uh, macroeconomic factors which influence the trade, such as slowdown in uh, Russian economies due to drop in oil prices and depreciation of national currencies, uh, re reduction in real incomes of population, uh, growth in unemployment and uh, poverty, and uh, decline in remittances, remittances from workers in uh, Russia. The previous speakers uh, mentioned uh, a lot of things about these factors. And uh, another important and new factor is uh, COVID-19 outbreak that uh, exacerbated uh, stagnation uh, on the in the Russian economy and decrease in consumer demand. Uh, th these uh, things threaten to sustainable and um, food security, uh, not only in Russia, but also in you know, Central Asian countries through trade, food ch changes in trade flows. Particularly, it's uh, uh, the Russian uh, uh, household demand could be uh, 
uh, switch to the domestic staple products that leads to the reduction in export of Central Asian countries to the Russian market. That's why a policy uh, that uh, address to these issues is very important and previous uh, speakers mentioned about it. Just I'd like to highlight that such policy that's very important that such, such policy should be focused on uh, formation, adequate, adequate social distance a, and hygienic regulations for production, transport, log logistic and marketing segments of food systems, uh, an increasing extent of localization in food value chains, support of agricultural producers and uh, most vulnerable population groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. I finished. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Romashkin. Um, I'd like to let all of our viewers know you have very interesting and comprehensive slides and your PowerPoint along with that of the other speakers will also be available for people to have a closer look. Um, thank you very much for your remarks on uh, trade. Um, I would like to then next move to our last discussant, and that is Dr. Vardan Urutian, who is the rector uh, at the Armenian National Agrarian University. We look forward to your remarks, Dr. Urutian. Thank you. Thank you, Rajul. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be part of this very important event. And I, I would like to thank all the speakers for very comprehensive and uh, informative uh, presentations. And also I would like to acknowledge the hard work and professionalism of IFPRI uh, people and Director General for this very important, comprehensive and timely report. Uh, I would like to do a couple of reflections on the implications of the 2020 Global Food Policy Report for Eurasia, but I will cover only the case of Armenia. And uh, with the first slide, uh, I would like to uh, show why it's important to have this uh, inclusion as an imperative for Armenia, as uh, from these numbers you will see that till now in Armenia we have quite a number of poor and vulnerable population. On average, 15% uh, of households in Armenia have remained still food insecure, uh, even though after the global uh, economic crisis, we are uh, recovering the, in the economy, but there is a stagnation and the 15% of the population still food secure. And we have quite a large number of uh, uh, in the population that are vulnerable. And uh, with these uh, graphs, I would like to show that Armenia is a shock prone country. So we have, uh, we are exposed to many uh, economic shocks and even in the last couple of years, uh, especially related to the Russian economic uh, challenges, the sanctions, we have seen also the implications on the Armenian economy. And uh, after every future shock like that, it's a, it's a problem uh, for Armenian poor and the vulnerable as more people will be basically pushed under the poverty line. And one every four people in Armenia still is poor. And this is very severe, this number in the rural areas. So the rural poverty is still very high. We have regions where still about 40% of the population of that region is considered as poor. So the unemployment rate is 17%. And uh, as I said, that every future shock, it will create a problem. And the shock is there, the COVID. And based on the World Bank and IMF economic prognosis, we will have uh, our Armenian GDP will drop by 3.5%. Uh, as our colleagues mentioned, in whole Eurasian region, it might deviate from 4 to 8% decline. And we have seen this situation, the global, global economic crisis. We were expecting that Armenia uh, will not be affected as that time the government was saying, but look at the number, minus 14%, one of the highest in the region. And uh, global economic crisis uh, affected uh, especially the food insecure and the vulnerable. So with this, I would like to really uh, highlight the importance of this first chapter that says that inclusion is really an imperative. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to reflect also on the uh, agricultural value chains. I believe this is the uh, second chapter in the report, and this is especially important uh, for uh, Armenia as uh, these our smallholders are responsible 
for at least 95% of gross agricultural output and about 80% smallholders have less than two hectares of farmland. And they have so many problems, land fragmentation, missing uh, farming and entrepreneurial skills, access to information, over indebtedness. Uh, the report highlights a couple of uh, points that I would like to mention. Uh, it, it first says these land tenure issues. Uh, you know, in Armenia, we don't have that land tenure issues, these inclusive policies. In fact, we have issues of uh, effective use of farmland. In, our, in my second graph, you see that in Armenia, which is a land scarce country, 51% of arable land is not cultivated because of different reasons, land fragmentation, uh, lack of uh, productivity, sales issues, etc. But also look at the first graph, credits to agriculture steadily is increasing. So this probably says about uh, over indebtedness. If the people are borrowing and farmers are borrowing, but the number of uh, uh, land, so the arable land is decreasing, and the last couple of years we have drop in the gross agricultural output, then there is an issue. Probably we are talking about the over indebtedness. Farmers are borrowing and borrowing to live off or pay the other debt. Uh, there is another important issue in the report that is very uh, applicable to Armenia, that's uh, promoting the modern agribusiness models, which I feel that there is a high potential in Armenia, uh, promoting producer organizations, agricultural cooperatives, and other agribusiness models. There is a, a lack of uh, uh, kind of little willingness to cooperate. And because of the inefficient legal framework, understanding issues, the connecting that, <clears throat> co excuse me, cooperation with this Soviet kolkhozis. So there is a huge potential of promoting uh, modern agribusiness models. Uh, and agriculture is a priority area for the Armenian government. Uh, there are lots of subsidies, mostly uh, credit subsidies, and these subsidies uh, provide very low interest rates. Uh, and under the COVID-19 circumstances, all these interest rates have been netted to zero. So the farmers can borrow uh, at zero interest rate. Uh, but I believe uh, still these are not effective for smallholders. Uh, there is also one problem that it was highlighted in the global food policy report, that's a data gaps. Uh, there was a nice paragraph uh, talking about how policymakers are flying blind or managing blindly and they couldn't understand the holistic picture of the food system. That's also very relevant, I believe, in, in all Eurasia region as well as in Armenia. And I believe uh, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a must uh, to invest in the strengthening the capacity of these institutions dealing with data collection and the analysis. I'm very sorry to uh, really see these social protection issues. Uh, uh, one of these uh, social protection program uh, was related to the school feeding program that is closed now amid COVID-19. And uh, this, uh, this was a very important social protection program when WFP and government were supplying uh, daily meals to over 80,000 school kids. And now this is closed. This is, um, and now these kids don't have uh, that nutritious meal that they were used to in the school. And uh, that burden is now in their families. And these families mostly were poor and the vulnerable families. And uh, also the change of diets, because uh, in the schools they were receiving very nutritious food, but in the in, in, the, in these poor families, uh, I believe it will be more stable food. Uh, our colleagues mentioned about this uh, COVID-19 implications on different value chains. I don't want to repeat. We have seen all these disruptions and failures along the supply chain. I was in touch recently with the greenhouse uh, flower growers. Uh, you know, they were crying. The export markets were shrinking. So uh, especially these uh, flower growers, uh, you know, they have to switch to the vegetable. They, they have done lots of investments. Now per 1,000 square meter, the monthly loss is about $6,000. Now you can see what a big loss is being created. The same is for the Armenian brandy and wine production. Uh, also the export markets were shrinking. Now they are, uh, the, the, uh, the partners from different countries are negotiating so that the prices will be much lower. And these companies will, uh, will, uh, will procure from the new, in, in the new season, they will procure less from the grape growers. And this of course will have a domino effect, the price fluctuations, et cetera. Next, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, 
I, I believe this was chapter three and four, but that it talks about the integration of women and youth. And this is also a very important uh, uh, policy implication for Armenia as well. As you can see from the numbers, uh, we have high rate of uh, uh, unemployment in the youth uh, and also young adults. And uh, also we have inequalities here in the earnings. Women earn about 34% less than men and own just 11% of micro, small, and medium enterprises. And with all these uh, women, uh, they are more vulnerable to poverty and food and nutrition insecurity. And why I have this remittance uh, graph here, as my colleagues also mentioned, a lot of examples from Central Asia, uh, uh, remittances are very important uh, income source for these poor and vulnerable households. And the remittance is, uh, segment is very important for our country. It comprises about 15% of the GDP. Last year, we received about $2 billion. And uh, you can see the shocks. Also, uh, every shock that is happening, the global economic crisis, the Russia crisis, and we see these flows uh, are changing. And uh, as amid COVID-19, it's estimated that remittances will sharply decrease. And 40%, it is believed that 40% of these remittances, uh, uh, basically, uh, those who are receiving these remittances are poor or very poor. And 80% of these remittances is spent on household. So it's very important, the policy implication is this reintegration of the migrant workers, as these migrant workers uh, didn't leave the country. A couple of thousand people came back as there were not employment opportunities in Russia. So our government needs to come up with very quick, uh, this reintegration policies and support or social protection programs for this. Next, next slide, please. And uh, I think this was the fifth chapter that is talking about the displaced uh, uh, refugees and conflict affected uh, people. This is also very important implication for Armenia as uh, we uh, hosted uh, since 2011, 22,000 Syrian Armenian refugees and 5,000 of these refugees uh, uh, left uh, and seeking others uh, more like developed Western uh, economies uh, ended up in Europe or Canada or US, but uh, while about 16,000 settled in Armenia. We have more or less good reintegration, 50% of them are employed, but of course there is a huge issue. Many of them uh, have uh, suffered from the mismatching of the skills, also, uh, and also job market requirements. Many of them ended up in the tourism sector, like Horeca, the service sector, and look at the nice growth we had during the last 10, 15 years. And last year we had 1.8 million tourists visiting Armenia. And uh, amid COVID-19, we are expecting that 80 to 90% will really decrease in 2020. And not only this uh, Syrian Armenian refugees will be affected, but it will be a domino effect because these 2 million people were eating, drinking, and you know, a lot of industries were basically uh, uh, benefiting from this tourism flow. So definitely another policy implication is that there should be another, uh, because it will be another shock. So it should be a reintegration or support mechanism uh, for the Syrian Armenian refugees. And the last slide, uh, please. Some policy uh, takeaways for not only our Armenian policymakers, but also for the region. Uh, so we have to work together to build inclusive food systems, support transformation already taking place. So Armenia is in this transition to modern transformative uh, food system. Uh, and of course, the social protection mechanisms, uh, targeted assistance, direct payments to these poor and vulnerable is very important. As I talked about these producer organizations and the cooperatives, so enabling environment, very good legal frameworks and the state support mechanisms are needed because I do believe and I agree with the uh, uh, reports of policy implication that through producer organizations and agricultural cooperatives, it's possible to uh, connect these poor and the vulnerable households to the markets. And there is an untapped potential in Armenia and I believe in the region as well. And uh, there was a nice uh, uh, paragraph on the hidden middle. So I really like that part. Uh, and I realized that in Armenia and also in the region, there is not that much related policy implications. And uh, I believe that there is a uh, potential as well here because there are lots of uh, 
employment, new employment opportunities if you develop that hidden middle of the supply chain. And of course, the data gaps, uh, we, uh, we are suffering as, uh, as educators, as policymakers. So strengthening the capacity of the institutions or policymakers who are responsible for data analysis or data collection. And also investments in uh, digital technologies, mobile, mobile applications, processing techniques. Uh, I believe this is very important uh, uh, area. And at the end, uh, <clears throat> as an educator, so I need to speak up about this, education is a critical for building inclusive food systems and uh, investment in quality education and research and developing professional extension services are very important for creating equally employment opportunities for women and youth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruti. And again, a very comprehensive presentation and we will make your slides available because there's so much rich content. Colleagues, we only have about five or seven minutes for our Q&A. And I know that a lot of questions have come in because I can see them. Um, I will do my best to, tar to direct as many as, uh, of them as I can. I ask our speakers to be brief in their response so we can take at least two or three or four. The first question I would like to direct will be to Dr. Kamil John Karimov, and this question is coming from Pishan Bay uh, with UNDP in Uzbekistan. Question is, majority of the smallholder farmers are not banked yet in Uzbekistan due to lack of collateral and assets. Are there any recommendations or research on this in Uzbekistan? Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Karimov. I'm not really aware of uh, any research which uh, was done yet, but I believe, as I mentioned in my uh, brief, uh, the, um, uh, the intervention, uh, there was a document which is produced by the government with the assistance of a number of international organizations, uh, which is called the, uh, the agri-sector agri uh, development strategy, long-term 10-year strategy, and while developing uh, those strategies, uh, different scenarios and the case studies were also uh, researched. So I believe during those uh, the, the interventions, uh, this matter was also uh, part of the focus of the researchers. But I'm not really, at this point, don't have access to any of that data. Thank you very much. I imagine there'll be interest in that topic going forward also. But let me direct the next question uh, to uh, Professor Urutian. Uh, and uh, um, if uh, other uh, colleagues wish to come in, perhaps Dr. Karimov also. But Professor Urutian, let me direct this question to you from Professor Uzun Vasili from the Russian Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. Um, uh, and the question is uh, essentially along the lines, Russia singled out the backbone organizations of the agro-industrial complex and measures of their state support in the conditions of a pandemic. Purpose of these measures is to prevent the bankruptcy of large producers. Are there such measures in other Central Asian and Caucasian countries? And I asked Dr. Rutian if he's aware of such measures in Armenia, and uh, perhaps Dr. Karimov wants to come in for Uzbekistan. First, Dr. Rutian. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, as far as I know, there are lots of measures to support uh, the entrepreneurs and the economic segments amid COVID-19 implications. But so far, I didn't see any, let's say, bailout, uh, let's say, measures. So there are, uh, let's say, tax, uh, let's say, uh, um, extending the timing for the tax payments. They're giving uh, subsidized loans. But in terms of bailing out an enterprise, I haven't seen. But uh, yesterday, today, the government uh, approved the 19th measure of the COVID-19 implications. So this was uh, boosting the new businesses. For example, every new business, it will start, the 25% will be grant from the government. For eight years, the remaining will be 0% loan. But the bailout to s support uh, such enterprises, I haven't seen. Thank, Thank you. you. And Dr. Karimov, would you like to add anything there for Uzbekistan? Uh, as for Uzbekistan, in terms of the bailouts, I have again, quite similar to, uh, to, to what uh, my colleague from Armenia just mentioned. Uh, at least there were no uh, information about, you know, the large uh, bailouts from the government, but of course government is taking very profound uh, 
uh, the steps uh, to support different businesses and enterprises. And that one of the important part of this is creation of uh, uh, the multi-million, around close to $1 billion uh, anti-crisis fund, uh, through which a number of different support projects will be funded. Right, including those uh, the uh, zero interest rates loans to, uh, including small uh, holder farmers and uh, and so on and so those who are engaged in uh, in in uh, agri food uh, sector because as I said this constitutes very important part of uh, Uzbek economy. Thank you very much. Let me direct the last question to uh, Dr. Romashkin, and this question comes from Kaka Nadiradze from AFRD in Georgia. And I will uh, slightly amend the question uh, along the following lines, that COVID-19 has created the most challenging environment for thinking about out of the box and bringing into the agenda of policymakers, new agricultural strategies, new food systems, etc. From your work with the Eurasian Center, do you see that there is a uh, a, a new uh, thinking uh, being put on the table for policymakers, new ideas, uh, and uh, and uh, new receptivity uh, to these new thinking. Over to you, Dr. Mashkin. Thinking from the policymakers because uh, the COVID nineteen is of unprecedented character, and uh, we should change not only our production system, marketing transformation, but also thinking, not only, I should say, the policymakers, but the scientists as well. And as if we demonstrate greatly, the, the thinking has been changed. And as for policymakers also, as our colleagues from Armenia and Uzbekistan answered, there is some shifts in, in uh, applying uh, and implying some instruments that previously uh, wasn't applied uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, the economic policy and agricultural policy as well. So I think yes, yes, there should be shifts in our in all of our minds. Yes. Thank you very much. And let me take the last question to Dr. Swinnan, and then I'll come to do the final takeaway. And Dr. Swinnan, uh, several times the issue of agro industry has come up. What do you see as the role of the private sector in addressing the uh, mm. uh, and coping with the COVID? Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Rajul. Oh, the private sector plays, has to play a very important role and is playing a very important role already. We have, it's been mentioned several times, I think on the lack of information, lack of data, I think that also applies to understanding what is currently going on in the, in the value chains and the activities, many creative, many entrepreneurial activities of the private sector. And we definitely have to uh, understand this better and bring this into the analysis of, of, and also how to move forward from here, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. I must apologize to the many people who have given us questions and I must thank them. And let me acknowledge a few of them as quickly as I can before I come to the speakers for the final takeover messages. Uh, we have Iroda Amirova from Uzbekistan. We have uh, Alexander Prishyapo from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, we have a number of other colleagues also from the region uh, who have not provided the names and our colleagues also at Tifpri, Katrina Kosic and others. Big thank you to all of you, but let me now come to our speakers for their final takeaway messages. Each of them will give us 20 to 30 seconds. What's the one thing they want you to walk away with? And I will go in the reverse order and I'll begin with Dr. Urutia uh, followed by Dr. Romashkin, Dr. Karimov, Dr. Akramov, Dr. Swinnan, and then Professor Shoba. So over to you, Dr. Urutian. Thank you, Raju. Probably I will repeat myself, but for me or for the policymakers, the final takeaway will be the investment in the human capital, investment in the education for inclusive food systems, and uh, probably this promotion of the producer organizations and agricultural cooperatives I believe is, is the priority and definitely digital technologies, this new innovative uh, investments in this innovation is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Romashkin. No, uh, thank you, Rajul. I will be short uh, in my final message. Just I believe that diversification uh, both in agricultural production and export market is essential conditions for develop resilient and uh, inclusive food system in Central Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Karimov. 
Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So my uh, remarks would be, you know, now the uh, words such as social distancing, isolation, massive lockdowns, border closings, uh, restrictions have become most uh, trending words, right, uh, for the last two, three months. Uh, but uh, what we really need now is a collaboration, partnership, solidarity in the face of the current crisis. Today, I think we have a very good example of how we can work together, despite all the challenges and the, uh, the distance we, which, which actually is, is, a, is a problem, right? Uh, so, but I think in the scarcity of resources, which we face all now, uh, they, our decision makers uh, need uh, more academically sound, uh, research-based evidence when they do decisions, important decisions. So that would be my uh, the takeaway message. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Akramov. Uh, I would like to highlight again the importance of connectivity and data availability for evidence-based policymaking. Uh, there are obvious uh, huge gaps in these areas in the region. And so I would like to highlight for governments to invest more on connectivity and data and also make policies more evidence-based. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Swinnan? Yes, I think this was a very rich session. I mean, it was much too much to say and much little time, I think. And so we, and so I think it ref also the many questions that we got, it reflects that this was a very important area, very important issues. I really want to thank our partners and the organization of the event, the speakers. And I think it's a clear signal that we have to continue this tradition. I mean, it's, it's really important and relevant issues. And I look forward to meet everybody live next time that we have this event again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the final word goes to Professor Shoba. Uh, my short comments. The new challenges are unprecedented for national agri-food systems. Delay in developing and implementing adequate responses carries not only social shocks, but also political risk in Eurasia. We need in more intensive cooperation to avoid this risk. Thank you very much, Professor Shoba. A big thank you to all of our speakers that such rich, insightful uh, comments, presentations. I encourage all of our viewers to please come back, look at the PowerPoints and listen again to this because there's so much richness in the presentation. A big thank you to all of our viewers around the world for taking the time to be with us today. And we look forward to continuing this fine tradition next year, hopefully in person. Thank you very much, everyone.